Well, hello, Chris. Hey, Mike. How's it going? It's going well. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Chris, for the listeners that haven't come across you online, tell our listeners who you are and what's going on. Why are we talking? Uh, My name is Chris Schiller. Uh, my, My wife and I have four pharmacies in Muskogee and Tulsa, Oklahoma. I am currently serving as the president-elect of the Oklahoma Pharmacists Association, and um, I'll be going in as president here. Um, Actually, I don't know when. That's a funny thing, because of COVID, we've kind of changed our meeting, our annual meeting. So I don't know when that will happen, but it should happen in the next month or two. When was it supposed to be? Our annual convention was late June or early July. I think if they ever got me into president-elect, they'd have to invent a COVID or something. If there wasn't one, they'd keep... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they just keep trying to put me off. I, I, I wonder if that's what's happened now to me. <laughs> I've actually heard of COVID, so I think you're good. I think you're good. <laughs> okay. You've got four pharmacies. Why are you about to be president of your state association? You're not as old as I am, but you're getting to the point where you're like, you know, I've got four stores. The boys are getting older. My wife and I can start taking some trips and those kind of things. And all of a sudden, you're going in to be the president of arguably one of the most active state associations in the country. We're very fortunate and very blessed with the four stores. Um, My wife's um, parents owned the the stores before we took over about four and a half years ago. Um, I've worked in pharmacy for 20 years three years now, started out as a delivery driver, you know, then pharmacists took over, you know, ran, and then now we, we operate the stores. Well, it was about three, two and a half, three years ago. And I got, you know, we're working hard in the stores and I'll be honest with you, I've lost a little bit of my passion for pharmacy. I love being a pharmacist. I love the, the relationships, but with the PBMs just on and on and just us just getting beat up left and right. When I was younger, I would go to a, a conference and that old guy would stand up there and say, either get into politics or get out of pharmacy, right? My as as a young, you know, as a young pharmacist, like, well, you don't know, I can fill a ton of ph- prescriptions. You know, we are so busy, I could always outfill whatever. Well, we got to the point, and we're getting to that point every day that the more you fill, the more you lose. And and so I'm like, well, you know, I've got I I've kind of lost my passion for pharmacy a little bit. So I'm like, well, let me see if there's something else that you know that I could start to do. So I thought, well. Nobody's really working to write in the PBMs to better our law. Or actually, I, people were working. I just weren't participating in our. You weren't aware. Yeah, of in our in our farmers association. So I I got invited to be on a, a committee for the um, pharmacy board uh, to to study one thing and give our opinion on um, compliance packaging or whatever. So I got that, and man, that really just got me going. It got me I'm like I need to be involved. I need to do stuff. I don't work as a pharmacist anymore. I haven't in in quite a long time. I'll fill in a day or two every once in a while. And so I'm like, I've got time. I can do this. Um, blessed enough that I could afford to, you know, to go to the city a lot and be involved. And so I've got to get after this. So I, I quickly joined OPH. I was already a member, but I actually started attending stuff. I got pretty immediately added to the executive board. That was about two and a half years ago. We had a, a situation where our current vice president had to step away. And then I got nominated to take that spot. And then after that, it was president-elect. And then this year, sometime I'll be president. When I went in, we just hit the ground going. I created a Facebook page just for Oklahoma pharmacists. We went into the 2019 session um, at the Capitol just full force. We had replaced our lobbyist that we had hired from the year for the previous years. We thought we weren't getting any sort of representation. We replaced our lobbyist. We hit the ground running. Me and um, three or four other... um, guys really really took off with it we we did it's our it's our bill house bill 2632 which is a pretty big deal it is it was one of the most and i think still is the most aggressive pbm regulation bills that that it's, that's passed a state of course just like the other bills that all the other states pcma has sued our state our state agreed to a stay until the Rutledge case at, at SCOTUS is heard, you know, the Supreme Court is heard. And so the st- stay means, you know, status quo. Everyone remains the same, you know, you know, PBMs don't do anything different. Pharmacy don't do anything different. We'll be fine. Well, then we get a contract um, that's just horrible from our, our one of our 
local or biggest insurance companies in the state, they subcontracted to another PBM to do their negotiations, which makes no sense. And it was way under our, our cost and it was ridiculous challenges. This was in the middle of what was supposed to be a stay. They violated the stay. So we met with our Oklahoma attorney general and told him, you know, uh, without violating any contract or anything, you know, what was going on, what was happening. And when he was, he was pretty upset about it. He's pretty fired up. They violated the stay as far as his opinion was by changing kind of the, the rules of what um, they were supposed to. So he lifts the stay. And so the, the P, PCMA had 21 days, whatever. So that 21 days passed course on day 21, they filed for an emergency injunction. Pharmacists stepped up. We, we, we formed a legal defense fund. Um, I mean, in a, in a couple days, we brought in a lot of, uh, you know, not as much money as the PBMs, but a whole lot of money for, for, for independent pharmacy. We have hired the law group that's, that supported a lot of the states around to assist our state in defending that law. I got to go to the actual hearing, even though it was a remote hearing. They did it like over Zoom. I, but I actually, there were three of us that actually got to go and sit in the courtroom for the preliminary injunction and heard that argument. Well, that was pretty exciting of why it would be so harmful if it was enforced now and how the excuse of COVID was used as we can't do this because of COVID. I mean, it was just crazy. And it's about eight days later, the judge uh, released his findings and denied them their injunction. So that's awesome for us because now that law is actually enforceable. He denied it to the, to the certain extent that he said that ERISA did not preclude any part of our law, and we were very strategic on our law. We did not, we did not um, regulate insurance companies. We regulated PBM specifically because it's the insurance company that's covered by ERISA. That's my understanding. I'm not a lawyer, um, and so therefore, we we regulated the PBM specifically and named the PBM specifically in our law. So therefore, ERISA would not um, overrule anything that we came up with. He even um, ruled that our law would cover a lot of Medicare Part D things, except for a couple things like the access standard, because Medicare Part D already has that, which ours were identical to that, and the fact that they can advertise. So an insurance company, you know, star ratings, if they a high when they can advertise stuff like that, because we made in our law that you can't put the name of a pharmacy on an insurance card. Unless you put all the pharmacies, as you know where I'm going with that, um, unless you put all the pharmacies that are contracted. Um, so we, our law covers a lot of different things. You know, obviously the Arkansas law is great. Ours includes a lot of that plus a lot of other things. They must have been before you a little bit, right? They were. They, I, I think they were a good solid year to year and a half before us because they passed a law, if I, if I remember right, in special session. And then... They had to come back because the PBMs just bypassed everything in that special. So this is my understanding, and I don't know 100%. And then they had to come back again the next year and and redo it. To the, and so they passed it again. So I think we were a good year to half a year behind them, but they got started quite a bit in front of us. Did you find with the stuff that you got back from the PBMs, did they think they were like, king of the hill or or did it seem to be like respectful even more so than you'd see in a pharmacy well so what we have to remember is as pharmacy pharmacists and pharmacy owners we see pbms in one light we see what they do businesses that that pay for insurance see them in another light they think that they're saving them all kinds of money as far as like the arguments actually in in court um it was pretty, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fairly emotional guy, you know, and so when I agree with something, I'm shaking my head. Yes. And when I disagree with something, I'm, you know, I'm like, I don't I don't know if I'm how I'm supposed to act in here. But some of the stuff was was laughable what they were saying, how they how they've saved the save so much money, how much this is going to increase cost, you know, and they do a great job. I mean, they have all the money, not all the money in the world, but almost they have a lot of money and they do a great job of, of PR. They do a, a great job of just hanging on to what they have. Um, so whenever, you know, you've got a, you know, a little, I always say, you know, I'm just a pharmacist from Muskogee, you know, and, and uh, had a couple buddies with me, you know, we're just local pharmacists going against these big companies that for years have 
built up their reputation and all this in the good way, because we see them in the bad way, but the other people see them in the good way, but their, their charts and everything. And they go, through, they've gone through this in almost every state or have, they have to fight the same fight in almost every state. So they've had their practice, but their charts and their explanations and all that to us, they're laughable. But to the, the, the judge, I'll be honest, I, I felt like we were going to win just from his questioning of both sides. Uh, he, he knew a lot about it. I mean, he knew a whole lot about it. He had educated himself on it, which I'm thankful for. And I obviously I still think even emotionally. So my thing was after we left, I'm like, emotionally, I think he's on our side. I don't know if on the law he is or, you know, if, I don't know if the law is or not. But apparently it was because that's how you rule. You know who was the biggest fighter besides PCMA, the biggest fighter against our law, House Bill 2632 in the state of Oklahoma? The Oklahoma State Chamber of Commerce. Really? So to me, as a local guy, right, I can get, I'm a member of our state chamber of commerce. I can go down there anytime. You know, I'm really, I, my whole life in Muskogee, been involved in that. We had to fight the, so to me, state chamber would mean local business, right? That is not what it means um, because these big businesses come in and they'll join, you know, they'll pay the $20,000 membership a year. And so they, I mean, I don't blame the chamber because they have to make their money too, but that was the biggest thing. So the way that PCMA or the PBMs use the chamber is to get to all those big companies. So in Oklahoma, we have like Chesapeake and we have Hobby Lobby and and um, I think Quick Trip and different things like that. So what they would, what they do, P- PBMs do a great job is convincing Hobby Lobby that if this law passes, your, your costs are gonna go way up because the PBMs gotcha. save you so much money. And so what we did to battle that, because the state chamber swings a pretty big stick at the at the um, at the Capitol and it does in every state, I'm sure. But what we did to battle that is we had some great, um, talented owners from across the state that made us a little graphic that showed the state of Oklahoma. And for every local chamber that we got to support us and to send a letter into the state chamber, whatever, we put that on our map. And so our map was just just full of local chambers supporting their local business to help, you know, counteract to our legislators um, against the state chamber. So they do, PBMs do a great job of, of selling their story or what they do to, um, to big businesses. Are you guys able to fight with actual documentation or is that breaking – contracts if you say judge i'm chris and i have four pharmacies and look how they screwed this you you can't do that really without breaking their contract right so you have to give ex- you have to give examples but then they're kind of watered down is that right yeah and 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 so like we're in an we're in an awkward spot because the the law just you know a couple of weeks ago got to where we can be enforced well, the, the office that can enforce that law is our Oklahoma insurance commissioner and the insurance department well, our insurance commissioner's office, as you got to think, that's a big learning curve. All of a sudden, you've, they've never looked at PBMs. I mean, never looked at them, didn't even think they were responsible for regulating PBMs. And then all of a sudden, they've got to regulate them. So they've hired a, a PBM specialist, someone who's worked in independent pharmacy before and someone who's worked for insurance before. And so this whole time, I've had our, our pharmacists from across the state sending in violations and complaints, even before it was enforceable. I'm like, if I have an employee, for example, I have an employee that's on their, her parents' insurance. They force her to go to a chain pharmacy and they force her to use a mail order for her specialty medication. Well, that violates our law. You can't force someone to go to a certain place. You can't change their copay if they go to a, one place or the other, and you can't force them to go to specialty. And you have to pay us as much as you pay anybody else. And that is in our law. Now, getting that actually to where I call that certain PBM and say, hey, you're violating our law. They'll be like, I'm sorry, we really don't know much about that yet. You know, we don't know anything about it. So therefore, this is it. Well, we've got to get our insurance department to to enforce those violations until we actually see any real change. So we haven't actually seen any real change. Can they do the opposite too? Can they say, hey, Chris, we found out your pharmacy was doing this. And you say, well, yeah, but the new law does this. And they're like, well, okay, but we'll see that happen in three years. In the meantime, you're breaking the contract that you signed. And so we're going to drop you. It's a scary thing to be out in front of this. I mean, you know, because literally, I mean, they, they turn off, I turn off three contracts and I, we're 
we're done for. Right. You know, and this is our livelihood. Um, but it, it is a scary thing, but I think it has to be done. I mean, we just couldn't continue any longer. I thought if nobody else is going to do it, I've got to at least, you know, try to get something done. And so we've been sending in complaints. We've got to get at some point those contracts that we've signed are going to be illegal in Oklahoma because of all the stuff that they put in there. They're going to be in violation of our law. Now, I don't know how long that will take. The law is still in litigation. So therefore, I mean, they they got the preliminary injunction denied, but now they're going to appeal to the Tenth Circuit. Well, the Tenth Circuit has not heard a PBM law yet. They have not heard one yet, um, to my knowledge. And so therefore, we'll see what the Tenth Circuit says um, with that. And then it actually has to come back to Oklahoma to be heard the actual case, not the, just the injunction, but the actual case to be heard. But, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of the of the of what we've done, the law we passed. I'm really proud that it, it's enforceable and that we, you know, at least I, I call that a big victory to prevent the preliminary injunction. Obviously, we're looking at the Rutledge, you know, case. And, you know, hope, I, you know, I wish we got would have got to see that in April heard. But, you know, hopefully this fall it gets heard. You know, who knows which way it will go. Hopefully it goes pharmacy's way um, and, and then we can build on that. If it goes the other way, there's still lots of things in our law that are a lot different than Arkansas's that I'm hopeful for that we may be able to get done. Is there a way for all the state to say, for example, Oklahoma and Arkansas and Ohio and these different ones, everybody gets together. We're going to have this federal law or does it always start state by state because i know that trump has thrown the pbm things could something like this just be a federal thing the pbms have infiltrated so much into senators and representatives and into the government that that like i can't even get my own my own u.s representative of my district to do anything against PBMs. And that's embarrassing for me because I've got a, we've got a lot of pool in Oklahoma and I can't get them, I can't get them to vote or sign on any letter, vote any way. Um, you know, and so they've done such a good job of donating to their campaigns and, and keeping them going that that's so hard to break into versus a state level, a state level, you know, if, if, you know, um, K, K pharmacy, you know, you see so many hundreds of people um, a day coming in, when you call your local leg- state legislator, they listen to you. They might know the customers, number one. Number two, they know the pharmacy. And number three, the lobbyists haven't greased their pockets because they're only so concerned about someone from District 75 or 6 in Grand Rapids. They're going to spend time on the 50 and the 400 in, in Washington. If Mike's mad at the local state rep or the local state senate, that local state rep and that local state senate um, has a good chance of not getting reelected. Those PBMs don't vote in their local district um, um, like like your, you and your employees and your family and your patients do. Yeah. And so that's where we have a whole lot of leverage because um, we'll never have as much money, but we have a whole lot of leverage because we have votes um, on the state level. And yeah, granted, we have federal votes, but it's not it's not near as impactful. It's too, it's a little too distant. So that's my opinion. The stuff you're talking about, I'm sure, happens in a lot of industries. And you mentioned money. Is that just like a check to the guy for his campaign or do they take him out for dinner and do this and stuff? How friendly do these companies get with these representatives. I think it's all of the above. It's dinners. It's probably trips, hunting trips. I don't know. I, I, I hear a lot of different things. You know, let, let's say that um, that company that that lobbyist works for, whatever, they'll write a check to their campaign. But also, um, you know, you can only max, you can only write a check for so much for to someone's campaign. But they'll also write a check, a check to a PAC, a political action committee, okay, that supports that that campaign. They'll also, from my understanding, can write a check um, towards a committee. So like the um, the Ways and Means Committee, and I'm not saying that I'm just saying rules, judicial, whatever committee, um, they can write a check to that committee, and that committee can divvy up money to whatever one, whatever representative um, that they want to. So I, I, I'm not an expert on that. I see what kind of goes on at, locally at the state, which is, you know, s- small donations or contributions, sorry. And then, you know, small dinners and stuff like that. Let's say a politician is getting wined and dined by some lobbyist. Do they get personal gains for that or just political gains? I mean, do they get money like in their bank account? For their personal bank account? Um, 
No, no, uh, no. Now, a lot of politicians and one thing we've experienced here and not so much just politician, but a lot of government appointed or uh, people will will have a deal when their career ends or they stop running for office. They go work for one of those companies or go. This is public knowledge. I'm aware we had a, 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 a an Oklahoma government employee that worked for the Oklahoma um, health care plan that that is for our, our teachers are all our state employees. And um, this individual was a, was a pharmacist or is a pharmacist and helped run the pharmacy part of, of the health of the health plan um, was strongly against um, our law actually helped write the, um, you know, what, what they do to see how much this is going to cost the state. You know, they'll do a thing to see how much it's going to cost the state. And they said something like $240 million a year, which was is ridiculous and helped write that. Give it, you know, give that. We had to fight that. We, we Again, we went unanimous. So we beat we beat it anyway. That person, after that session's over, went and wor- went to go work for a PBM. Is that right? And so, I, I, you know, maybe it was just convenience. Uh, maybe it was a coincidence, but it was just, uh, it was, uh, you know, that, that was a good um, experience in, I guess, politics. More than likely, it's going to be something like, hey, Bob, we're going to put a good word in for you to HR when you're done with this. And, yeah, yeah that's <laughs> right, right. That yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really something. What got you to sign up for that first committee with the state? Because I know you said you were kind of feeling out of it and not real enthused in that. You said that you were on this committee and then the the state wanted you more involved. How did you actually, though, get on that first committee? What prompted you to either walk in there or pick up the phone or do something to get on that first committee? Well, excellent question. So, you know, I, as I said, I'd kind of lost my passion for pharmacy. I was, I was looking to see what, not that I'm quitting pharmacy, but what my next goal is. I'm a very goal oriented person and I, I, I like to achieve, I like to accomplish. And I'm thinking, well, it's, so I kind of started kicking around the idea of maybe going into politics a little bit. I actually got an email from the, the state board, which I think they sent it out to, I think every registered pharmacist that if you wanted to serve on, it was called the co-mingling and automation committee. And so what they were doing is is putting pharmacists from different styles of types of pharmacies together to form rules for commingling. So compliance packaging, you know, the the rapid pack that, you know, puts all your medicine in the one pack that you take in the yes. morning. Well, we needed rules. Make sure it's labeled right. Make sure, you know, that everybody's the and then also automation. Once we got in that session, I don't know, I just felt really engaged. I felt really I'm like, man, I could I can make a difference here. Two questions. One, would you like to be president of the United States? Uh, um, um, you know, I got that's a, that's a that's a that's a funny question. So we had, uh, before, uh, let's see, it was in Sunday school before COVID. Of course, they actually asked a question: what you could, if you could do anything and not fail, not fail at it, what would it be? And I put run for president because I, I thought, you know, they're like, why would you want to do? I'm like, are you kidding? Right. I mean, yes, I would. Now, is that a goal of mine? No, I uh, no. I actually would like to be a U.S. congressman. Um, but um, but yes, I mean, I yes, I think that would be great. So here's my follow up question. If you could not tell anybody that you were the president, let's say you had to have a mask on and let's say that none of your family knew you were the president and you just came home like on the weekends and you were just Chris. Mm-hmm. Would you still like to be the president then? Or is part of it the popularity and so on? Here's what I'm getting at. I always thought years ago that I'd like to be in politics. But I realized it was just to try to be known or try to be famous or try to be appreciated or whatever. And I didn't know a damn thing about what I wanted to accomplish. It was just like a glory thing. I remember I asked someone one time and they said, I just want to be the county commissioner. That's where I can really make my impact and this and that. With that in mind, what would you be a federal house that that would be cool for you? That's where you could really make an impact. I think so. Yes. Yeah. So a U.S. Congress I mean, and the House of Representatives. Our district in Oklahoma is District District Two. Um, we I think I could make a big impact. I mean, I I uh, I'm in healthcare. The thing is this: we have a, we have a, a, a city in our district that has the lowest life expectancy of anywhere in the U.S. 
right here in the district in Oklahoma. And that's that's embarrassing to me. I mean, it's embarrassing to me that we're not taking care of our of our community better. Um, there are lots of things we really struggle. You know, pharmacy obviously struggles. Um, our rural hospitals are really struggling. We've got the the cattlemen and the ranchers right now. So I don't know if anybody's talked to you about the the meat industry is basically turned into farm the pharmacy industry. So you've got three big meat packers, okay, that literally are putting out a business, they put out a business, all the mom and pop meat packers with the help of the government and regulation. And literally they've driven the price of beef down um, as far as paying, paying the farmers and the ranchers, but up for us, the consumer, and that those middle meat packers are making all the money. So that's oil, you know, oil we do, Oklahoma, obviously a lot of oil and gas. We really, I feel like we have no representation or we're very underrepresented. What sounds kind of cool about that to me is that you have the handle on, and I guess this is what all politicians are supposed to do, at least at that level, they're supposed to have the handle actually on individuals in their district or, you know, and then also have a federal voice, basically, right? Yeah, I mean, because they're representing, you know, the the constituents, the citizens of the United States, and then specifically their their district. And the difference between being that and a state representative for the state is you're maybe not dealing with enormous laws or, or not enough power. Or... It's, it's state issues, so it's a, you have a smaller district, yeah. and then you're dealing with state issues at the state capital, and not not in D.C. You're not getting as much efficiency for your punch. Yes, the states are the states, um, and we're all separate. But the federal government. I mean, oversees everything. You can change it for the whole U.S. That's right. Why that and not a senator? I, I think because I live in the, the the largest city in my congressional district, I have a much better chance of, of winning that than a senator. Everybody in the whole state gets to vote for the senator. So every state has two and and they're, everyone in the whole, it's a statewide election. Um, most of ours come from either Oklahoma City or Tulsa. Um, which are the bigger cities, and so they're going to have more of that that plug in or whatever. Um, so I, that's that's why I think the the House of Representatives would be a better a better fit for me. I'm not saying I wouldn't want to in the future run for Senate, but I think the step to that would be through the House of Representatives. Yeah, there's nothing you dislike about the Senate. It would just be that you'd step to get there. But if someone said you're going to be a senator, you wouldn't like that any worse than being in the Congress. I think at some point you would you would prefer that because there's a hundred, right? It's the it's it's you've taken four hundred and I don't I don't know four thirty five. Now you your vote is one out of every what four hundred. Now it's one out of every hundred, and so it's just a more impactful, more way to help people to solve problems, solve issues, to make you know make your constituents have a voice. Um, so no, I mean that would be that'd be great also. At what level did the smear campaign start? Were you in a smear campaign to win the uh, president elect of the farm? <laughs> you know, I was thinking, Chris, you got to remember that I'm from the city of Gerald Ford. So when you were talking about the vice president of the association not being there, I mean, that's like Spiro Agnew for me. You got Gerald Ford written all over your face. Uh, no, I was actually, I was brain, I was actually pretty. I, I, I got, let's just say, I got fast tracked through. Um, and I think that was because of my drive and what I was wanting to accomplish. Um, and it was literally my second or third executive council meeting of representing my district that that all of a sudden the vice president wasn't there anymore <laughs> and, and had some issues. And then and I got nominated. Yeah, so that's like, cool. OK, sure. You know, and and then that puts me in a commitment for vice president, president elect, president and then past president. So it puts me in a four year commitment with OPHA um, to, to serve through. Let's say that you ended up as a congressman. What would a next step have to be after your presidency at the Pharmacy Association? Would you first run for a state seat somewhere or? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think um, I think that it works for some people in, in politics, but I'd like to think that I would. And it all depends on the political wins. Right. So, I mean, I we know that Trump didn't hold anything, you know, so that's right. And, and, and um, uh, if I had his bank account and, and <laughs> you know, in his fame, I guess I could I could do that. Yeah. Right. But um, it all depends on the political wins, how they flow. It all depends on if the incumbent decides he's not going to run or, or does something else. Um, it all depends if there's a 
uh, you know, a uh, you know, a controversy or, or something's found out. So I don't know. I don't know. So I, I've kind of I've delved into a few different things. So obviously we've got the four stores, which my wife does a wonderful job at, uh, at really the a lot of the day to day stuff. Um, and I've kind of, you know, I don't really work as a pharmacist. I've, I've, I'm into the OPHA this year. I didn't have to spend as much time at the Capitol because of COVID. But like last year, we were at the Capitol three or four three days a week. So I was driving to Oklahoma City three days a week, but it's impactful for you to be there. I mean, it really is, makes a difference. Um, so that, so I don't know what my next step will be. And it all depends, you know, if, 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 um, if the opportunity is there to run in, in 2022, well, maybe I'll do it. If it's not there, I'm uh, 2024, 2026, you know, whatever, whatever I can make the biggest impact, you know, my kids, you know, one's almost out of high school and then one's kind of going to be starting high school. I don't want to miss, you know, I will, because I think I can make that big of a difference. But um, if, if the opportunity is not there, I'll wait um, until they're, you know, they're out of school. I don't want to miss ball games ever. You know, I can't imagine your schedule trying to get to all your kids stuff, but, but uh, I don't want to miss if I, if I don't have to. And the thing is though you have a, a boatload of time when you look at our two guys running for presidency 70 some and it's remarkable normally that's when people are are taking it easy you know that are retiring and so they're they're at the end of their career so their career's over and it's not that they're so it's they're kind of just seen as you know well we're just going to retire we're going to travel we're going to do whatever but now they're taking on the big, trying to take on the biggest thing. You know, I would assume the, the probably the most responsible ability thing that there is, as far as offices, anyway. Even to have that kind of energy, I mean, those guys are just like pounding it. It's so incredible. I want to tell the listeners too that when you're in your political life here, you're bringing quite a few skills to the table because you've also done a vitamin line, right? You know, along with that, losing my passion for pharmacy, getting into, you know, politics and, and, and associations. I went to a, let's see, we do compounding at, at three of our four stores. And I went to a PCCA conference about two and a half years ago. And, and it's a hormone conference. And I've go, I, I go almost every year to one. And this one talked a lot about gut health. And, and, and I thought, well, you know, I'm a good pharmacist. You know, I recommend when patients get an antibiotic that they eat some yogurt, you know, and stuff like that. Or I recommend the cheap probiotic over the counter. Well, I realized pretty quickly that I'm not a very good pharmacist when it comes to probiotics. And so when I got home, home, I started to look for a, a, a probiotic that, that had enough CFUs to make a difference that was affordable for my Muskogee area people. Yeah. And I, I, I either I found stuff that was, you know, $5 and not worth the $5, right. or I found stuff that was 50 or $60 that no one's can no very few people could buy. Yeah, right. And, and so what I thought, well, I wonder how much it would cost if I came up with my own formula and I had it manufactured. And so I did, and I, I it wasn't cheap. It wasn't cheap at all. I was just hoping that it would work out yeah. and we would sell it because we didn't sell a whole bunch of probiotics before, and it did. It worked out great. Um, and so I developed a company called Capsulations, and it's Capsulations with a K. And, and my first product was Probi Probiotic 30. And we made a 30 count bottle and, uh, and then we also made a 10 count bottle. And the reason 30 count bottle is retails for $28. Um, you get to double your money. So you pay 14, you get to sell it for 28, you make 14 bucks. Gotcha. Well, that's a pretty good markup on a, on an antibiotic that you may have got paid 98 cents. Right. To fill, exactly. Right. Um, and then for patients, one of my pharmacists was really worried about in Muskogee, at one of our stores, people being able to afford 28 because $28 is $28 and it depends on where you're from. So we made a 10 count bottle that again, you get to double your money, but it sells for $12.99. Cost $6.50, sells for $12.99. We sell out of every 10 bottles, we sell eight or nine 30 counts. We hardly sell any of the tens, which is odd, but it's just a, a perception. And so between our four stores, we sell about 100 bottles of probiotic 30, the 30 count a month, which is impactful. I mean, that's money. That's a lot of money that, that's cash that we're not depending on a PBM. We're not waiting for a payment. And so what I did is I would I would took that and then I would do another product and another product. So I, I, we have uh, about 15 products, digestive enzymes, uh, vitamin D, 5,000, 10,000. Um, 
we, we keep our, our probiotic in a cooler right there by the a little mini cooler right there by the, the, the pharmacy counter. And we talk to every patient that's getting an antibiotic, a stomach medicine about that. And so last November ish, I started selling. I thought, well, I wonder if this could help other independents because you're tired of making eight dollars on something you paid twenty two for, you know, and you're selling it for thirty. So I went to a few of my friends and I'm like, well, we'll give it a try. And they've had a really good success. And so since November, we're now at forty four independents, and I'm only going to sell to independents. No forty four independents in four different states, and I we get about. Oh, five reorders a week, which is great. You know, that means they're selling it. I've got a guy in Georgia who literally sells the 10 count, which is odd. He sells the 10 count. Um, he, he started about two months ago and he's reordered. Let's see. This last reorder was 75 of them. And he just reordered a hundred of them, 50. And then he changed it to a hundred bottles. So he's made it a competition at his store um, to see, you know, how many they can sell really? and then he's rewarding his employees. So what I'm trying to do is, is not turn this into a, I'm going to sell you this. You're going to make money off of it, you know, but it's something that's good for your patients. You never feel bad selling it because these products are really good for your patients. You're going to make a little cash off of it, but I'm trying to turn it into a, a, a program, not just, Hey, buy these for me and go sell. Gotcha. Them. I'm trying to turn it into a support program to where we, we provide you with, with um, social media posts that are already pre-done with your logo, your pharmacy's logo on it, that you can advertise. Uh, we provide you with some training videos. I tell you how I sell them. I'm gonna get Ben in Georgia who's selling the 10 count like crazy. I'm gonna get him to do a testimonial to teach you how to sell them. Because you know if you're selling a few uh, Florigen, for example, you're selling it for about 30 bucks. It costs you 22. You're making eight bucks and you're not selling very many because you're not working at it. But if right. you work at it, you actually will sell a lot. So we've got quite a few things. Thanks for bringing it up, Mike. I appreciate it because it's something that I'm really passionate about. If you can't tell, um, it's been a lot of fun. I've got to go to uh, a lot of different independent pharmacies. So pre COVID, I would just go to the stores and I would talk to the pharmacist. I'd help them get set up. During COVID, it's basically been done over, you know, through um, the internet and then just delivery. But I can't wait to get back out because it's a lot of fun going to other independents and seeing what they're doing. Knowing what you know now about your life, I know you love your children and your wife. In fact, I saw your thing on Facebook. <laughs> I was I got to stalk my guests a little bit beforehand. I saw that on Facebook and you were giving a shout out to your wife, Becky, for your 20 years of... It was our 20, 21st anniversary. 21st yeah. anniversary. And I was about to get my Kleenex out and cry because you said she was very <laughs> consistent. And I thought it was going to be that she, you know, <laughs> left a little uh, Hershey kiss on your pillow or something like that. But then you leaned over and you uh, shut off her hair straightener. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, what I did is I appreciate how consistent she is, <laughs> she is. And for every day for the last 21 years, she's given me the opportunity to do this. So, and then I turned off her straightener. I'd done previous videos yeah. of, of the straightener of a, a how to, a how to turn off a straightener, <laughs> uh, because apparently it's pretty difficult. Uh, and I got a good response out of that too. I always turn my wife's off, but then I get in trouble for turning it off because it's like, I was going to go up there and, and do this till I'm like, Margaret, we're like, we're like three minutes late already to leave for the concert. You're telling me you were going to still go upstairs and use that thing. Yeah. I was going to go up and do this or that. I'm like, you, you were not. So. Well, Becky's usually already gone. Um, on some days she'll get up before me and she'll go and, and then she'll text me sometimes, hey, check my straight. Check I mean, straight. I do it every day, <laughs> but, but she'll text me sometimes to do it, uh, which, it which is a lot of fun. So, yeah, that, that was, that's a lot of fun to do. Let's go back 10 years. We know you're not going to change your marriage, your children, any of that kind of stuff. And when everybody would say, well, I would buy the winning lottery ticket or something. But if you sure. could take a different direction from 10 years ago, knowing what you know now and so on. Would you have done anything different? Would you have been politics earlier? Would you have gone into this sales earlier with the vitamins? Would you not be in pharmacy? Would you have done something else? And I know this is just fictitious. We're not going to go back. But would you have done much differently? I know you're good where you are. You're happy where you are. But 
would you have done anything remarkably different? Um, I, you know, that's a great, that's a great question. And, um, we, um, Actually, so I'll, let me come back to that just real yeah. quick. We ask all of the people that we interview for, for jobs at the pharmacy what their dream job would be. You know, if, if education didn't matter, location or money, what your dream job would be. And, and, and so as we ask people that, I think about that all the time. So I would preference this with what my dream job would be is to work on an island as a charter boat captain is what I would like to do because that would be a lot of fun, yeah. right? Okay, but now back to semi-reality, semi-reality. 10 years ago. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, we had just opened the first Tulsa store, which my, my in-laws were, were great at letting me letting me do that. They said, OK, here we picked a great spot. Christian, and we had just opened, you know, they, they spent a whole lot of money. We got a beautiful looking store, freestanding. I'm thinking we're just going to kill it. We went up there and we marketed. We did everything. First day, we filled seven prescriptions. I thought, oh, my gosh, I've ruined the whole family, <laughs> right? And anyway, so within a month, we were doing, a, I mean, it's great. I, so I wouldn't change anything like that. One thing I would change, and you brought both of them up, I would I would probably do the capsulations earlier. I would start that a lot earlier because I think it makes it make a big difference mm-hmm. in our businesses and in others. Now you would have done it, but back then, uh, you know, Amazon was hardly even going back then. So, you know, we we didn't need very many niches back then like we need now, it, even though I feel like we were in all of them. You know, we compounded, we did, delivered, we do everything. I probably would have started being more involved in my pharmacy association earlier. Yeah. I would have probably leaned more towards politics a little earlier. Yeah. But I, I, no, I don't think there's anything I would change dr- drastically. I loved opening that store. And then four years later, we opened another store. And I loved that challenge. Yeah. You know, that's, of course, seven percent. Descriptions. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, yeah. I'm getting kicked out of the family. <laughs> right. But but then I love that challenge of getting that store profitable yeah. and then starting it again at another store and then getting that store profitable. I loved that. Um, I just kind of, I think I could have done, I guess to answer your question, I think I would have rather worked more on the business than in the business because I was the pharmacist seven days a week, all day long for a long time. And I wish that I could have changed that just a little bit, not a whole lot, but but just a little bit. Just a little. And then the problem with that, though, is, you know, maybe you would have had time to work on something that would have been the wrong direction. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the stores might not have been as successful. Yeah, right. You know, if I wasn't doing it as you as you know. But yeah, it's it's um yeah, so I don't know. The what if game is fun, but I'm really I'm really proud and very happy with what with what I've done over these last 10 years. Yeah. When I'm done, I think I want to be done. How about you? Do you see yourself like dabbling forever in the stores or do you think there'll be a day where you turn that switch off and you're just doing something else? I don't know. I, I forever. My, my goal is to be to, to build a, a legacy or continue to legacy and continue to build a legacy is what I would like to do. So my oldest son, you know, who's 18, uh, we're, 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 you know, talking about colleges and different things and what he wants to be. But the apple doesn't fall far from the tree most of the time. So he's he sees, you know, what all we do at the pharmacy. And so he's really interested in pharmacy. Well, so is my younger one already. And I'm like, guys, you know, pharmacy is a great career. I don't know if it's going to be a great career in 10 or 20 years from now. Um, so I'm kind of stuck with that because if they want to go into pharmacy, that's great. And we'll support them as much as we can. And at that point, that I think that would be an easy – I mean, I don't know. I think that would be an easy – as far as just like selling out and then being completely away from it, I don't know how – I don't know how I would do with that at first, but now in five years from now, it might be completely different. Right. Um, because if you were to ask me 10 years ago, I'd be like, I'm going to work here every day the rest of my life. Yeah, right. Because I, you know, I really enjoy, and I still really enjoy it. Yeah. But now I'm kind of seeing the, the different stages of life change, change what you want. I don't think we can even predict where five years is. And so we don't know if we're going to have to make choices or it's going to be forced on us or we're going to be forced to be there because we couldn't even hardly even give, give our stuff away. Who knows? Well, I might be the only one standing there filling prescriptions because that's all I can afford. And that's why that, you know, we're fighting Oklahoma, you know, us, us independent pharmacists from across the nation are having to fight this, this battle. And it's not because we're greedy. You know, it's not because, I mean, our, our, you know, we're inherent to help people, you know, and that, and, and, 
PBMs have exploited that. They've exploited that insurance companies don't pay us for services because they know we're going to do them anyway because we help people. And so we're having to fight for that to keep us viable. Well, Chris, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Nice meeting you. Nice to meet you, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. I've had such a great time um, on your show. Thank you. I'm going to come visit you in Washington, Congressman. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And at least leave a spot open. All right, Chris. Thanks. Thanks, Mike.